In today's video, we're going to walk through three uncomfortable truths that many retirees and advisors ignore. If you're new to the channel, hi, I'm Julia, and I'm a certified financial planner and the managing director of a retirement planning firm. Throughout my career, I've seen retirees suffer at the hands of these truths, and I don't want you to do the same because today we're going to solve it. In this video, I'll walk you through these uncomfortable truths and more importantly, how you can use them to your advantage. I encourage you to stay until the end of the video because I'm going to cover income planning, tax planning, and even personal life planning. So let's get into it. The first of these uncomfortable truths is that there is not a safe withdrawal rate, such as the 4% rule that you must follow. I'll explain why, but first I need to define how the 4% rule works. This rule that dates back to 1994 states that retirees can safely spend about 4% of their initial retirement portfolio over a 30 year time horizon adjusted for inflation without running out of money. So let's say that Kathy and Sam have 2 million at the start of their retirement, and we'll use an annual inflation rate of 3%. Using the 4% rule, they would safely be able to withdraw $80,000 in year one, and then adjust that amount each year for inflation over a 30 year time horizon without running out of money. So in year two with 3% inflation, you would pull 82,400, in year three, it would be 82,872 and so on and so forth. While there are many issues with this rule, such as the fact that it doesn't account for taxes or fees, and that it requires a portfolio to have at least 50% invested in stock, the biggest issue with this rule is a psychological one. You see, humans don't spend in a linear fashion meaning that in reality, nobody is spending the exact same amount every year adjusted for inflation. There are months and years that we spend far more than others. And we as humans cannot stick to any method that's too rigid or strict for any length of time. An easy example of this is trying to lose weight, right? Crash diets or crazy exercise programs will only work temporarily before we give way to our old habits. The same way we'd feel if we were forced to spend the exact same amount of money every single year. We've all heard of the go-go years or those early retirement years where we're still young and healthy and we spend a bit more than we did when we were working. And then we have the slow-go years where we spend less. And then finally, the no-go years at an advanced age where we typically spend only 70 to 75% of what we spend in our go-go years. This phenomenon is very real, and it's what I've seen for the past 15 years in working with retirees. So the 4% rule, or frankly, any static withdrawal rate, just isn't dynamic enough to work in the real world. For example, our clients' portfolio withdrawal percentages typically look a lot like this. These folks here are retiring in 2025, and we can see that their withdrawal percentage starts out much higher than 4%, before it gradually falls after about 10 to 15 years. And this particular withdrawal sequence gives them a Monte Carlo percentage chance of success of 93%. And this is well over the 80 to 85% chance that we look for. So what ends up happening for folks that rely on the 4% rule many times is that they actually end up spending too little, right? And end up leaving way more behind than they ever intended. All the while feeling anxious or uncomfortable if they spend more than that 4% in any given year. A successful retirement income plan is all about having guardrails in place. More about those in an upcoming video. But basically, guardrails can tell you the range that you can comfortably spend each year while still maintaining a high percentage chance of success. For instance, these folks that have a 93% chance of success, they now know that they can be a little bit more flexible with their spending and that as long as they can pare it down in 15 to 20 years, they can do all the things that they want to do while they're still young and healthy. In fact, we only want to see at most an 85% chance of success. Nothing in life other than death and taxes is 100% certain. And though we have many clients that would love to see that 100% chance of success, it's just not necessary to retire prudently. We look for 80 to 85% because that says that the large majority of the thousand different possible stock market outcomes that can occur mean that you can reach all of your financial goals. These clients here really want to help their kids and grandkids. And we can see that they can actually spend $12,000 more per year during the first 10 years of their retirement and still have an 85% chance of success. And guys, this is using a 7% withdrawal rate, okay? Now, we can only cover how to solve the withdrawal rate dilemma in a small amount of detail here, but I will be breaking it down in more detail in a few weeks. So to make sure you don't miss it, click the subscribe button now. It's important for retirees to run a financial analysis so that they're not over or underspending 
both of which can bust an otherwise great retirement. The second uncomfortable truth is around tax planning, and it's that you should probably not follow what's called conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom is a widely held belief that upon retirement, you should pull income from your after-tax assets first, so your savings and your taxable brokerage accounts, then your pre-tax accounts or your traditional IRAs and 401ks, and lastly, your Roth IRAs or Roth 401ks or your tax-free account. And while I normally agree that Roth accounts should be pulled last, I'm going to show you why conventional wisdom fails in most every circumstance I've analyzed, and I've analyzed hundreds of cases. Conventional wisdom misses the fact that the years between retiring and pulling Social Security are a golden opportunity to pull income from pre-tax accounts. So whether that's to spend or to convert to a Roth account. See, once you retire, your tax bracket will likely be a lot lower. And that's why it's so important to take advantage of that at tax rates that we know. Because no one knows where tax rates or brackets will be in the future. But if we look at history, we can see that we're in a very low tax regime currently. But let's look at an example using dollars and cents. Here's our hypothetical couple, Dan and Kathy Smith. They are 65 years old and they just retired. They have a joint savings account worth 100,000 and a joint brokerage account worth 350,000. Their largest investable asset is Dan's traditional or pre-tax IRA at a little over a million dollars, which is really common. You know, we typically see that the largest asset is in that pre-tax 401k or IRA. He also, though, has a Roth IRA worth $52,000. Kathy also has a pre-tax IRA worth $240,000 and a Roth IRA worth $30,000. You'll notice that I use pink, red, and blue colors here to highlight the different accounts tax type. The pink is for pre-tax or traditional accounts. The red is for Roth or the tax-free accounts. And the blue stands for bank, bank or brokerage, otherwise known as your after-tax account. This will be helpful once I start reviewing the different withdrawal strategies, as they will be color-coded as well. Their combined Social Security checks equal $4,700 per month, and they spend $8,500 per month net. This means they have an income gap each month of $3,800. Now, we know that their Social Security checks and certainly their spending will not stay at this rate, but we have to illustrate this somehow, right? So we're gonna inflate that number at 3% for inflation. And at age 85, their monthly expenses will decrease from 8,500 per month to 5,900 per month. And this is based on that statistic that your base expenses decrease by about 25 to 50% once you reach an advanced age. And we've certainly seen that in our practice. This amount will begin increasing by 3% now as well. For the purposes of this video, Dan and Kathy will both live to age 95. Also, this software is using current tax rates plus the expiration of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2026, and then nominal increases every five or so years, which is our best guess for the future. Okay, back to what most people do when they retire, and that is conventional wisdom. We can see this outlined here. They start drawing income from their after-tax accounts, shown in blue first, and then at RMD age, they start pulling their required minimum distributions from their pre-tax account shown in pink at age 73 all the way to age 95. This means that they would fill their monthly income gap of $3,800 per month with their after-tax accounts or their bank or brokerage account, the $360,000. They do this for the first few years, and actually they can pay $0 in federal tax those first few years because they're in that long-term capital gains tax bracket of 0%. I did do a video on this, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. We can see that up until RMD age, their tax liability is very minimal. However, once they turn 73, or their required beginning age, they are now forced to pull out a certain percentage of their pre-tax retirement accounts, and the percentage starts at about 4% per year and gradually increases as they age. We can see here that their tax bill gradually increases as well in the highlighted column. And that's why in this chart, I put the required minimum distributions next to their total yearly tax so that you can clearly see why their taxes continue to increase over their lifetime. So in total, they will pay $487,647 in income tax from their current age 65 to age 95 using conventional wisdom. Okay, now let's look at the optimal distribution strategy to lower their lifetime tax bill by almost $50,000. And this is without doing a Roth conversion. We can see that this strategy has them pulling from all three of their tax buckets at different times and different amounts. First, they should pull certain amounts from their after-tax and pre-tax accounts. Then, once they've reached their required beginning age for RMDs, or age 73, they should start to take any living expenses not covered by their RMD from those tax-free Roth accounts up until 2044, when all of the living expenses will be covered by that required minimum distribution. So, Instead of paying zero taxes initially 
you will pay a bit more at first to save taxes down the line. This simple and painless switch allows them to save over $48,000 in taxes over their lifetime. This chart here shows us the break-even age for taxes paid, and that age is 76. So this means that if they live past age 76, they've made money using this strategy. It's important to remember that the average life expectancy of a 65-year-old man is 83 and a 65-year-old woman is 86. So, you know, if you live past 76, there's a good chance you're going to make money. And we also want to look at it from a portfolio break-even perspective. So we can see here that the break-even age for the portfolio is 77. So that's still well below average life expectancy. And this is why we take tax planning so seriously. So if you need extra help with your tax or distribution planning, click the first link in the description and we'll take a look at your exact situation to help you come up with a game plan. Okay, the third uncomfortable truth is that retirement is not all about the money. While being able to afford retirement is of course crucial, if that's all you have, that's not enough for a successful retirement. One of our clients, Craig, said it best when he said, it's not what you retire from, it's what you retire to. And his statement says so much in so few words. Oftentimes, successful, previously career-oriented people have a very difficult time in retirement. When you leave work, you're no longer John Smith, head of operations, or you know Nancy Edwards, vice president. And you can start to feel like your identity has been taken away. It's important to take the time to get really clear on your new purpose once you retire, but preferably in the years leading up to it. The most successful clients are those that spend time on the financial or the money side and the personal lifestyle side as well. You know, your work may have been your calling and your primary purpose for a really long time. And listen, I can relate to that. But our identity is really who we are on the inside. And when you get wrapped up in your career, your identity may have inadvertently enmeshed into your purpose. So for those folks that don't take the time to, the, to address that, the first year of retirement can actually be very depressing you know, after all the vacations are over. There can be a feeling of, what is the point of my life now? And that means that no matter how many vacations you can afford or how much stuff you can buy or even how much time you have to spend with family, you're not gonna feel truly happy and you're not gonna be able to enjoy all of your hard work. I've seen this with a few of our clients and they struggle so much in those first few years even pushing important people in their lives away, and they just didn't have to do that. The reality is that you don't have to stop working. You just need to find new jobs. So if you find yourself really into your work and you're getting ready to transition to retirement, I want to give you three steps to take to prevent these consequences. And the first step is to ask yourself, what were you working for? Of course, sometimes we work simply for the prestige or, or power, but more often than not, we're working for something much bigger and much more meaningful. So even if you answer that question with money, right? You did it for the money, there's still a purpose behind the money. So what was it for when you first started your career, right? Was it to take care of your family, keep them safe? Was it so that you could afford to explore other interests that you, you know, that work didn't fulfill? Was it to have extra money to donate each year? Taking the time to answer this question can help you get closer to your core values, which brings me to the second step you need to take some time to complete a values assessment. And you can Google these, um, it, but it's basically a list of different values. So let's look at one here. We can see that we've got accountability, achievement, balance, respect, security is a big one. And, and what I want you to do is print this out and circle your top 10 values. And we want 10 so that, you know, when we have natural life shifts, that we can move to a different one. So for instance, one of mine is balance, but if I retire and I'm immediately thrown into having to care for a family member 24 seven for a few months or more, I'm not gonna feel balanced, right? I'm not gonna feel like I'm living in my purpose. So that's why we need 10 so that we can move to a different value when we need to. Now, once you've chosen your top 10, I want you to prioritize them in order of importance. And this is an important step because we want our day-to-day -day lives to reflect what's most important to us so that you can feel like your new job or maybe the new jobs in your life actually speak to you. And the third step is to brainstorm new ways to put these core values to use. For instance, if security is one of your top values and you already have financial and emotional security, maybe you can help others get the same. We have one client that helps his grandkids learn about money, banking, and saving, and also keeps a watchful eye on his kid's financial picture too. We have another one that basically moonlights as a home security person, meaning everything from your literal home security to fire safety, kid safety, etc. 
And he doesn't just do this for his own family, he does it for anyone in his neighborhood that wants it. This makes him feel very useful and it really enhances his mood. And this isn't something that you have to do all day long, right? It's just something that you can do for as many hours as you'd like to get that feeling of purpose in your life. There's no better time to start planning for the personal side of retirement than today. So remember these. The next time you hear someone say that there's some perfect withdrawal rate or that tax planning isn't very helpful or that, you know, the personal side of retirement will just magically fall into place, you know that those things are not true. And obviously everybody's situation is different, which is why it's really important to seek personal professional advice. So if you'd like my team to take a look at your situation, click the link in the description below and I'll see you next time.